Thank you. Um, so the, uh, the introduction there said it already. We've got um, the rail industry itself is not um, hugely responsible in some ways for the uh, carbon uh, emissions and the uh, issues that we see with some of the broader issues around uh, clean air, but it contributes. 20% um, of the UK, 29% actually of the UK rail fleet is diesel powered. Um, but over 50% of our network is not electrified. And that's because whilst we all hear the stories of electrification, we all know that uh, high-speed routes need electrification, and uh, we, we, you know, we hear all the stories. Of course, there's a vast network around the country that doesn't actually, it doesn't justify electrification, won't be commercially viable to electrify, because it's a relatively expensive process and a high-maintenance system wants it up. So we, we will retain a fleet of trains that currently are all diesel. Um, those, that fleet is second only in size to the German fleet, uh, within the confines of Europe at least. But rail still is a very clean way of travelling. Uh, we contribute about 0.8% of that 22% that transport is, is, is responsible for in terms of global emissions. So in some ways we could sit back on our laurels and, and sort of think, well, all's good, uh, and let the rest of the world worry about its emissions before we start to look too guilty. Um, uh, possibly like the marine sector, some would say. But obviously, bad news always catches up with you. So the bad news has just been mentioned in some ways. All those people coming through Paddington, a recent survey found that over five days, and it could be any five days if we're honest, um, the station each time it was tested was found to be in breach of the uh, relevant clean air regulations, the levels of nitrous oxides, the levels of other pollutants in the air were too high. Uh, higher than the street outside, and obviously we all know about streets outside being problematic. So we've got options for rail uh, on what we might do. We need self-powered trains. We have a problem with diesels, particularly in stations, but globally, let's face it, across the country we've got a problem with diesel. Um, whether, any, whether there's people in here who disagree with it or feel we can address it technically, there is a public perception issue with diesel. And so what we need is is a form of train that will go where the wires don't go. Um, uh, so we'll call that a self-powered train, and, um, and, and we start to then think about that need, how, what's going to make it, how, what's going to make the industry adopt it? Why are we going to do it? Um, and so what we've seen recently is, is a very similar initiative to the, uh, to the automotive sector, I suppose, a, a government policy, um, or, or challenge to the industry at the current stage, at least which said we should be able to get pure diesels off the track by 2040. If you can do it on roads, surely you can do it on rail. How hard can it be? Um, and, uh, and of course, it, it can be quite hard. Um, there are a lot of issues to do with the scale of trains, the weight you're carrying, the nature of the services you want to provide, the safety, all of those things. But we need to find, and I think the industry is facing up to the realities that it needs to find a solution. Um, so, if we look at what has been used for powering self-powered trains over the years in, in the rail sector, it's a relatively... Uh, I'm sure there are someone here will know of a, of a scheme I, I haven't got on there, but fundamentally they're the main four. So coal we started with, and you can see there the, the energy density per kilogram. Um, you can see the same for diesel, uh, which we, is, is, if you like, the global staple uh, traction system at the moment. Uh, and as we've discussed statistics, statistics for the UK, then you've got lithium-ion batteries. Um, I say lithium-ion, um, let's not limit it strictly to lithium-ion, but the general current battery technology um, at about 0.6. And hydrogen, which looks fantastic at 120 megajoules per kilogram, uh, a, a great density of energy. Trouble is, that kilogram of hydrogen uh, takes up about 11 cubic metres of space at normal atmospheric pressure. So it's, you know, Elon Musk would tell you that the battery, it might be heavy, but it doesn't need anything to convert the energy. Um, and you, you've just got a direct feed to your motors. With hydrogen, you've got to put it through uh, a process. The process we put it through is the fuel cell, which um, combines the hydrogen and oxygen to create water and electricity uh, and a bit of heat, if I'm honest. So the, what, what that gives us is a range of options. So 
in those pictures there, the, the, uh, the white train is actually a, a trial train that was created in the UK about three or four years ago. Um, it was called the IPEMU, we love acronyms, and the, that stands for the independently powered EMU. We seem to have moved to the phrase self-powered now, um, whatever you want to call it. It basically had a massive battery, um, and what that battery did, uh, apart from weighing about seven to eight tonnes, was propel the train in the same way as that train could drive itself electrically under wires. Um, but it wouldn't do it for very far. So whilst it gave the same performance as an electric train, it did it for a range of about 60, 70 miles. Um, you wouldn't want to go any further than that before everyone gets a bit twitchy. Uh, and you obviously needed to get there and back on that range because you, hadn't, you couldn't charge the battery. Um, I think that's another issue we're going to have with, with electric vehicles, but I don't want to get into too many arguments in the room. So. <laughs> Um, so, for rail, 60 to 70 miles isn't your typical journey um, for the vehicle. It might be for the commuter or for the person on board, but it's not what, the, what the, the train is trying to do. It needs to go further, quite a lot further. And so, what we've done at Alstom is, is um, develop over the last few years a fuel cell powered train. So, I say fuel cell powered, and having dissed batteries just a minute ago, I need to confess that it's a fuel cell plus batteries. Um, and uh, well, a very large battery. Uh, and what we do is we combine the two in a hybrid drive system that allows us to use hydrogen as the primary energy store on board and use the battery uh, to uh, build up an energy reserve using regenerative, regenerative energy from braking and be charged by the fuel cell. Uh, and then we manage the, uh, the use of that energy to propel the train. So the train in question was the blue one on the previous slide. It's, it's called an iLint. Um, all future tech starts with I. Um, it's, uh, and basically what it is, it's, it's a diesel design which has been evolved as a fuel cell train. Um, it has the uh, primary hydrogen equipment mounted on the roof um, and it has uh, battery and other auxiliary kit and traction motors underneath. Um, the eagle-eyed amongst you may have noticed that German trains, European trains, are a lot bigger than UK trains in their sort of cross-sectional profile. Um, and so from that point of view, it's quite a... Um, uh, it, it has different spaces and different areas on the train to package the equipment. But for the UK, it's entirely plausible, and we're currently working on the development of a, a UK application of that tech in the packaging that we have here. The really clever thing about it, though, is the way that you manage the use of energy. So um, it, it's very easy, again, uh, anecdotal evidence only. When you see a Tesla on the motorway, it's always in the slow lane. That's because someone is metering their use of energy and thinking, where's the next charging point and will someone else have their Tesla plugged into it? I might say. Um, and um, having just got a, a car that's electrically charged as well, I'm discovering the, fe the features of range anxiety myself. What the train does is does that thinking for you. It balances the energy source and, and an area, a key area of development has been how to use the fuel cell and the battery so that you don't, you don't have too big a fuel cell. You don't have, you, you've got to balance out the, the use of these techs very carefully. Otherwise, you, you end up either carrying too much fuel, which is a weight penalty. Um, that fuel is, because it's so big at atmospheric pressure, is stored on the train at 350 bar. Um, and then it is um, in pressure vessels, which are heavy and relatively... Um, inefficient in space terms because they're all cylindrical. So you don't want to carry too much fuel, you don't want too heavy a battery, you want everything optimised. So you, you work out the optimum to fit the route you want to do and you teach the train where it's going. So the train knows exactly where it is, it knows what timetable it's keeping to, it knows the real time, it guides the driver on what to do. It's not an autonomous vehicle in this instance, could be. Um, it provides all the data necessary, um, but one step at a time perhaps. Uh, and so what that, that then allows us to do is, is create a, a zero emission at point of use product, which is optimised to deliver the best mix of performance and route that we can. So the island actually carried its first passengers last Friday. Um, it's actually due to go into a regular passenger service in about a month's time, a couple of months' time. Um, but it's, uh, it, so we have two of them built and operational and ready to go. Um, we're just uh, in the final ap approvals process. As you can imagine, innovative technology carrying uh, a novel traction energy source on a train 
is quite an approvals process. Um, I know most of us will wrestle with that if we look at alternative fuels and alternative technology. Um, and it's the same for the railways. Um, the train itself does, um, this one is designed to do up to 90 miles an hour. It uh, has a range of around about 1,000 kilometres, so probably about up to 10 times what that battery train did. So it gives you a more plausible package for running your regional railway services and uh, it allows you then to start to displace the existing technology with something that is zero emission. Now, we heard earlier from, from Ray, I don't know if he's still here, but that um, he has severe doubts about the hydrogen infrastructure. And he has some, there's validity to that concern. It, it does need, we do need to grow the hydrogen infrastructure, but equally, we need to grow the electrical infrastructure if we're gonna charge everything and, and run on batteries. So I would say, Yes, electricity's got a bit of a head start, but it's not one. Um, and so our view is that the future of uh, green rail travel could well be, or will need, hydrogen fuel cell trains. The end. <laughs>